Hey everybody, welcome back to new videos channel and today we look into the Nox Dev tools, what they can actually do and how they help you building better applications. Here we go. The Nox Dev tools nowadays come by default with any new Nox application and even if you have an older one or you say, hey, I don't want that, you can change it and configure that like almost anything in Nox.js. And today we will have a look in a real world application, not minimal this time, and we'll see what benefits the Nux Dev Tools give you for our daily development and also give a little outlook in how you might be able to configure them and what powers you can wield with the Dev Tools. So let's jump right into it. And one of the best applications to showcase that, in my opinion at least, is Elk. Elk.zone. This is an open source Mastodon web client fully built on Vue and Nux.js. There are still regular releases and it's used by thousands or even tens of thousands of people daily. So that's pretty amazing to have that as an example. And for that sake, we started, we have that run on localhost, right? So this is going on right here. We started that, just cloned the repository, installed the dependencies, and we're good to go. Now, what we wanna do right here is we wanna click down here on this lovely Nuxt icon. And as you see, then this little icon is actually turning into dev tools. And if we don't hover over it, then it will also disappear again. Now we have a couple of options here. We can open the dev tools, right? You can toggle them. Then we have the number that is the time, the page needed for loading. And then we have also here the component inspector where we can click on any component and have a look. So for example, we can do that. And it will tell you, oh yeah, okay, sure. This is app components status, status body dot view. And we can click on here and it will be opened in our VS code editor. But more about it later. Let's open the DevTools first. We click here and the first thing we get, okay, we have an overview. There's some updates available. It's also great. Good to know we can click on it. Say, okay, we get that start screen that you'll probably get if you never opened the DevTools before. And we can say, okay, let's get started here. And um, we have a lot of information like, okay, Nux is used, which view version, the Nux DevTools version, how many pages, components, modules installed, plugins installed, etc. how long SSR to follow took, the page load, the navigation time, and so on and so on. It, you will also see this um, access from an untrusted browser warning that some features are limited. If you click on it, you'll be able to actually validate that. Then you have to go into your VS code and there either click on a URL or if you want it, you can simply use the token that's there and just copy paste it in. I'll go with the token here because we won't open our VS code at all. And now this is actually authorized and this allows us some uh, special options. So also here, once again, this opening in an editor, this uh, is a lovely feature with the inspector, but we have some more things coming up right now. So let's open the dev tools back again here. And on the left side, we have a lot of different tabs and they even more. So we can go through them and see what's actually happening. So the first one is the pages tab. And this is super helpful as soon as you have any kind of routing, which probably most applications that you have do. If not, it's probably a smaller one or one that just doesn't need routing collection of landing pages. But even there, you might want to use that. So it's probably rather a small application, which is more than fine. The best part is here we see not only which routes exist, all of these 56 here, different types, if there are middleware, either here we see an inline middleware and here we have the off middleware straight away and we can always jump that open an editor, which is pretty helpful. Take a look, okay, what uh, what's going on there exactly? But besides that, we also see which routes are marked as active because they might match certain criteria or also up here, the route path itself. So in that sense, we have a great overview. We also see all the middleware that's set, for example, globally. Then we have the off middleware here and also our manifest route rule middleware is also global. And we can also have a look at all of them. We always have the option to, for example, copy the path if for whatever reason the editor doesn't work or we just want to copy it over for debug purposes, we're good to go. Now, another thing we could do is we can up here just change the URL. So we can, for example, say from slash notifications when right now I want to go back to the index page and on a push of enter, we actually do a full navigation. So this panel is super helpful to see what your routes are actually doing, what routes you have, the middleware and overview, also the names of all the routes without going through the virtual file that displays them, for example. All right, and after we talked a bit about the routing part, let's jump to a more fine granular level, which is the components panel. And that holds, as the name says, all our application components will show us which are used and not used and a few more things. Let's take a look. And back at home at the slash homepage of our uh, application here, the components 
panel is open, we see a couple of different components. So for example, we see user components. So all the components that are actually defined in your application itself, account avatar, big avatar, etc., etc. There are quite a few. We'll see which ones are used and how often they are used as well. So here, for example, three times the common checkbox that could be part of other components, right? References. Or for example here, yep, yeah, not at all. So that's great. You can filter them as well up here by using and not used. Quite helpful to so see maybe which components are uh, right there on that page or not. We have runtime components. So for example, ITN related, router links, uh, some V drop down the menu V tooltip, and of course also Nux building components. And then we even have the overview about components from libraries, like here the color scheme component, the Nuxlink local for ITN, or the uh, unlazy image here from at unlazy slash Nuxt. So here we actually see which library components are also used on our page or not, and which are available. So it can be super helpful to also debug which components are loaded and which are not, and maybe to think about which components maybe should not be uh, there. But there's also another view. So this takes a little bit to generate, but we have this wonderful, lovely graph of all the components and how they're used. We have different color codes here for components, global components, even some unknown parts, which are probably, yeah, the pages here. Not sure why they're not marked as page, but they should be issue incoming. And then we also see the relation. So for example, here we see, okay, common and found. Well, that's coming from uh, server slash add accounts, because of course it can be that's just not found. State is not found as well, etc. So we also are able to know how components belong together. And we can even double click and see how things are referenced. For example, this timeline conversations here, uh, that component is used in uh, conversations.view in the page. It also has the conversation paginator as dependency. And we can even say, hey, please filter it out so we have a smaller graph and see how they are all connected. So for example, the conversation paginator here is belonging to common paginator, etc., and the conversation card, and so on, so on. So this is a lovely visualization about the components and how they're used. And you can easily detect components that might be hot paths that maybe should not be loaded, as mentioned before. And of course, before we can just click on one like here, status body, let's say have the inspector up here again. And we once again can get a nice overview if you want to. We can also say like, okay, let's uh, show layouts and pages in here. Let's clear the filter. It's also important. And then we, for example, see, oh yeah, here main content, a lot of pages. In this case, still report is unknown. They uh, clearly indicate main content should be on a lot of these pages, which makes sense given this is a social media application, right? The Mastodon client you can even say, hey, let's uh, include our node modules. Let's see how long it takes to generate. Oh, it wasn't that bad, actually. So here we see a library components and we also see some are unused. We already know that. So the Nux layout here, for example, we, we didn't use that at all. Or in this case here, the Nux link should be <laughs> used quite often. I mean, how would an application work without links, especially of that size? right? So that all makes sense. It's a lovely overview. It's something I personally use, especially when digging through new applications or uh, reviewing certain parts to see how everything fits together. And that's a lovely uh, representation here. But of course, the actual list is also helpful, especially with the filters here. And you can, of course, also search. So if we say like we can search for our main content, and then we find it here and can take a look and see, okay, what's referencing that and so on. Now, from here, let's jump to the next panel, which is the imports panel. And we once again have some composables here that are imported and functions. So let's open these. And here we actually see all the things that are defined. We see 283 composables from 49 modules. It's quite a bit. And we see here, there are also shared types in here. We have Mastodon related components to searching to icons and so on. We can click on things and see, okay, how are they referenced? We can go to the source if we want to, also in our VS code. You won't see it right now because we have only the browser, but that's uh, pretty neat. Also, if you filter by either using or also not being used, that's great. Say composable, so also only directive. Well, directives are a bit sparse here, not any use, which makes sense. And then we have the composables also from libraries, things like view router, Pina, view use, of course, a good bunch of lovely composables here. And of course the built-in ones as well. Now. If computer is composable, that's a bit questionable, but I think you get the gist here. And from there, we jump into the next panel, which is the modules panel. That's also pretty straightforward. We see which modules we actually have installed, and we even see how long the setup time of each module is. So here, four milliseconds for Uno CSS, view use under a millisecond, Pina, and so on. So that is also a way to detect if there are some very slow uh, Nuxt modules that take, that make startup time go crazy 
and go very high. So these are installed modules. Then there are some uh, user modules, of course. So modules that are defined in your application that you can't really install separately. And um, that's also great. So you have an overview over your uh, self-built modules there. Of course, you can also install new modules here straight away from the registry if you want to. And that would just do all the things. For example, if you would like to install auto animate here, we can click on it. And then it would also ask us, hey, do you want to do that? We can add it to Nux config for you. It's all pretty seamless, but uh, not adding any new modules here. You can try it though. This is one of the DevTools features that are really, really straightforward. You can also do it from the terminal, which is probably what most of you users would like. But if you want to have more of a uh, WYSIWYG or a UI uh, overview here, that's a great option too. To be fair, I personally don't use the modules tab that much because I get all my infos out of the next config anyway and do otherwise things in the terminal. But as I mentioned, the UI overview is still great to get a grasp, especially when you have a lot of built-in modules or like self made modules and you want to get an overview, it's still quite helpful because these are auto registered. So you don't necessarily see them in the next config themselves. And from the previous modules tab, you go to the assets tab here and we see this is basically a list of all the images that are baked into the site. We have different icons here, screenshots, of course, the fonts, emojis. We don't want to open all the 3,698 items here, some avatars, um, and then of course, things like the fab icon. So there's also just a lovely overview to see what's loaded in total. The number here is quite high given the emojis, but that's also understandable because, I mean, we kind of need them when we write social media posts, right? So not much to say here, except you can also filter, of course. You can also actually upload them. Say, I want to like do an upload here uh, and put an asset down there. It's quite interesting. You have different views if necessary, right? To just have that folder structure. But all in all, um, that's, again, a great overview. Never used the file upload here, but it's great that there is the option. So I love the idea that you can have different entry points depending on the way you work. Next one up is the render tree panel here. And basically what you do is you see all your view elements and your Nuxt application as you'd see it in the, the view dev tools classically with props, setup, et cetera, et cetera. So here, for example, you have the, the Nux dev tools itself. So like the thing we are in right now, some kind of little inception moment, we have just the view element outside that is probably for the either loading indicator or arrow page. Um, that would be something that I could take a look at the editor and we'll see what it actually is. And uh, in this case, it is actually the inspect panel. So if we would open this, this is the view component. It's also just built for view in the end. And then we have our app, right? Our Nuxt application here. We have the ARIA announcer down here. We have the Nuxt layout with a key. And then we can dig down the tree and see how components are loaded. Pretty much how the view dev tools work as well. We can find components if we want to. We have all the information that are helpful, like where this Nuxt link is going, for example, what's on the Nuxt page, if things are a fragment or not, what the router view is showing, and so on. So if we, for example, go for it down here, okay, home, it's on the suspense default, that's great. We see uh, the, the route that's passed and the V node, et cetera, et cetera. So this is lovely for debugging. And once again, if you want to click, for example, on this one here, um, on this publish widget, we'll just open that in the tree right away so we see what is going on and that will help a lot by debugging a bit more than uh, things like console log. I mean, it's still helpful or debugger, but to see which props are passed without logging all out is quite helpful. So definitely make sure to use that. And with that, if you use Nuxt, you don't need the Nuxt and the view dev tools. You can just go for the Nuxt dev tools itself. All right, the next tab is a tab that you might not all have that panel. It's the Pina panel. And if you don't use Pina in your Nuxt application, then you won't have that here. Just more than fine. Not everybody needs to use Pina, but if so, there would be the stores. We have a timeline where you can like restart, uh, start recording events and say like, okay, let's stop. We can clear all timelines. We can record more. Of course, the usual hint, yeah, it's important that this can cause performance overhead. So you should only enable it when needed. You also have some settings if you want to be uh, notified about new or deleted stores. And that's basically that. Unfortunately, I don't have one store uh, for commands. So that's not a good example here, but it will be quite obvious, very similar to the Pina DevTools integration in the view DevTools. Let's take a look at the next panel, which is the runtime config panel. That's of course very interesting because here we see our application config. Uh, we see the public runtime config that is set uh, with everything, everything that modules might do, everything that is set as defaults, for example, from IDN, everything that you set here. Also, you have the 
private runtime config here, which of course you should not necessarily show on a video or on a stream because that might be most of your private keys. For Elk, well, surprise, it's empty. So all good, no secrets leaked. Uh, especially because this is the mocked version, right? So there is nothing to leak here, luckily. And that can also help and cover seeing, yeah, what uh, things might have changed. You can, of course, also alter the runtime config on Go, especially the public part, right? The private part you can't. That's read-only because this is something you have to change in the server that's not available on the client. It's only for display purposes only. Still super helpful to see what happens between you putting something into your runtime config versus uh, what the eventual result is. And same, of course, for the app config itself. The next panel is quite interesting if you use service at rendering because this is the payload panel. So here we see everything from use state and from use async data. So whenever you use any of these, you will see the whole payload. So what has actually been returned, you can refresh the data, you can change them, and that will also help uncover potential problems. So for example, for Nuggets Dev Tools, that's only having the time that the SSR process starts versus then to calculate when the page has been loaded properly. Then we have the color mode, of course, say like, okay, what's our preference? And here, no use async data is used, so there is no data shown. One helpful part here is also this refetch all data. You can, of course, also trigger that programmatically, but sometimes this is a lifesaver to say, okay, hey, I just want to get all the new data and see if things changed for debugging. So that's quite helpful here too. Coming up next, we talk about the plugins tab and why this is helpful, especially if you have any kind of Nux plugins running, you will love that one. Because opening the tab will lead us to all the plugins that are actually executed in all the right order. So from all the next plugins that are actually included by default, so the built-in ones where they actually being triggered, then we also have some virtual ones, right? And eventually we also see all the plugins that we wrote in our application ourselves. So in this case, the plugins from Alc directly. And also here we see if they're on the server, the client or both, then there's no tag and we can jump into them directly if you want to. This is super helpful. And we'll also see how the execution time, uh, how long that is, or if there are any issues about that. So in this case, that looks uh, kind of okay, I would say. And then we even have some more tabs down here, 13, and also a bunch of settings. But you know what? This is it for part one of our lovely Nux DevTools overview. If you want to see part two, let's have a look at the other 13 leftover panels, plus, of course, the settings to see what we can change. I promise you there's some mind-blowing things there. Leave a comment below if you're interested. Other than that, take a look around the channel for all the other videos. And as usual, see you all in the next one, which means either next Friday or if it's already, then, well, continue watching. Anyway, have a lovely day and happy hacking, folks. See ya.